as I go on here. All right. Well, welcome to our offsite construction series, which is the second and last Tuesday of the month. Um, we are doing digital presentations um, due to um, this pandemic, which we're hopeful we'll get through very soon. That's always my hope every time I have one of these. So we wanted to thank you all for being here. And um, my name is Audrey Grabesic. My company is Modular SureSight. I am a general contractor in the state of Colorado, assisting uh, modular builders and retailers in order to build modular projects, both residential and um, commercial. So with that, we're gonna move to our partners for making this series possible. Mountain View Window and Doors is an amazing company that was doing all residential commercial projects um, in that space and now has moved over to Modular, which is super exciting. And Scott, why don't you take it away and give us a little bit more information on Mountain View Window and Door. Thanks, Audrey. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Scott, I'm Marketing Director of Mountain View Window and Door. Um, as Audrey said, uh, we're a window and door company based in Colorado who has recently moved into the modular space. We do a high, lot of high-end custom residential as well as some commercial. And we really value uh, working with forward-thinking professionals from all over the AEC industry. So if you have any window and door needs uh, in, Col yeah, in Colorado, hit us up. All right. Um, our next sponsor or partner would be Greg Crom over at 303 Development. Greg is a general contractor that has done all residential and commercial projects and multifamily as well in the traditional space. And just after the last three years that he has met my company, he has moved into the modular and panelized offsite construction um, industry. So it's nice to have him on board. Um, 303 Development is a design build company. Urban Air Living is actually a modular company. Um, they do all ADUs or accessory dwelling units. Sometimes they're called granny flats. Um, the unique thing about Urban Air is not only do they make the space feel like 800 feet from a 500 foot square footprint, but they also have these cost efficient and uh, functional wall unit and bed units that make the space look and feel bigger. So we love Urban Air Living. And then the art of construction, I'm like, you take this away, Scott, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks again, Audrey. So art of construction is a media platform and network of forward thinking AC professionals. I was born at a Mountain View window and door here in Colorado. Uh, we have a podcast you can listen to online. Uh, we did a whole series with Audrey called System Built Lifestyle. And now we're moving into the modular space on the architectural and development real estate side as well. And we'll be having some great content coming out um, in the next months and years. So stay tuned and you can find us at the AOC.us. Thanks, Scott. And this brings us to our show today. Our today guest is Tom Hardiman. Um, he is actually the executive director for the Modular Building Institute since January in 2004. Um, MBI is the International Nonprofit Trade Association serving the voice of commercial modular construction. In, in this capacity, Hardiman oversees and governs the compliance of the association and implements the organization's specific mission. He has also served as a registered lobbyist with the United States Congress and state legislature of in West Virginia, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland. Um, Hardiman also is the executive director of the Modular Home Builders Association and currently chairs the National Institute of Building Science Offsite Construction Council. I am super excited that you are here. Thank you so much, Tom, for making um, this opportunity work for us. I think that it's always great to have a professional that's so in depth into the organization as you are. So welcome and you can take it away. Well, thank you, Audrey, and thanks for having me. And uh, maybe just an easier way to say all that is just the modular guy. If there's anything <laughs> modular, I usually raise my hand and volunteer for it. I like having uh, my fingers on the pulse of everything that's going on in the industry. So I appreciate you uh, having me on today. So um, just real quick, I've got some slides I'm gonna share, but certainly if anyone has questions throughout, or if you do, Audrey, uh, feel free to stop me. I think it'll make it flow a little better as a conversation. We'll be uh, happy to so. do that for sure. Okay. And, and we're ready to go when you are. I'm excited okay. to hear about what's going on in the industry. 
Excellent. Well, uh, I'm hoping you could see my slide, Market Trends yes. and Modular Construction. You're good. Thank you. And you've already um, did a little bit of my intro and a little bit about MBI, but I'll, I'll uh, touch on it again. Uh, Modular Building Institute was founded in 1983. It's an international nonprofit trade association, and we serve uh, the modular construction industry, uh, primarily the multifamily and um, commercial markets. Uh, we've got about 450 member companies uh, all across the globe, really, and that includes manufacturers, architects, owners, contractors, developers, suppliers, uh, the whole gamut. So kind of uh, start to finish on the modular projects, we've got the, uh, the membership covered. And you touched on this, we're, we're essentially the voice of commercial modular construction. So a couple quick facts, and I'm sure if anyone's been uh, tuning into your, uh, your series, Audrey, they know all this, but uh, uh, maybe for those who are not familiar, uh, modular construction, when we talk about it, um, we, we think it's easier to think of modular as a process rather than a product. Some people, hear modular construction and they think, oh, you mean trailers? And we cringe a little bit and we say, no, it's a construction process. Uh, in our world, modular means three-dimensional volumetric boxes uh, rather than uh, panelized systems or, or precast systems. Um, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, in the US, uh, I think you know this, but all modular homes and buildings are constructed uh, with the same codes as uh, stick-built. Uh, projects, and that's typically some version of the I codes, the IBC or the IRC. Uh, we do not represent the HUD code manufactured housing industry, so that's that's another group. So we're we're modular. Um, and then uh, you know I like to say this, and I'm, I'm, again I'm sure you know it. Almost every construction project out there has some form of prefab or offsite or modular component to it. Um, even the window systems, uh, roof trusses. Almost everything has some prefabrication uh, to it. So it is definitely not a new concept. It's been around for decades, hundreds of years, depends on whose history you want to look at. Uh, not a new idea, but we want to touch a little bit about what's changed over the last five years and, and where we see this uh, heading going into the future. Um, just incidentally, I've been the director since 2004. And it has changed dramatically, uh, really in the last five years, let alone the last uh, 16 since I've been on board. Um, I'm gonna to touch a little bit about the advantages of modular construction. Uh, this is kind of the why you should use modular. Um, but rather than just hit you with selling points, you know, we are the trade association, so we're gonna say nice things about modular. Uh, I wanna back it up with some uh, statistics and, and data. Um, so a lot of these next few slides came from the Dodge uh, data and analytics report that was released last year. And I'll show you where you can download that uh, in a moment. Um, traditionally, we don't like getting into uh, cost savings on a modular project. We get emails and calls all the time saying, uh, how much cheaper is modular construction? Um, and that's, that's, that's like saying how much cheaper is one car over another? Well, the answer is it depends. There's a lot of factors that go into the cost, uh, including the project, the contractor, the experience, the labor market, materials prices, as we know, that one's lumber prices are uh, playing some games with us. But uh, we do have some firm data from Dodge uh, Data Analytics. They did a survey recently last year and NBI helped them. We helped them draft the survey questions. They uh, sent the survey to architects, engineers, owners, general contractors, and subcontractors. And they asked a series of questions and, and all of their findings are in this report. But I wanna highlight a few of those um, here with you. Uh, and then the first one is cost savings, budget certainty. Uh, when asked, you know, the impact of modular construction on your, on your budgets, 91% of general contractors said they had a cost decrease in their projects versus a comparable site mill project. That's huge, 91%. And if you look at that bar in the middle, that 48% said it decreased by 10% or more. Well, that's a big number. Um, but 91% of all GCs say there was a cost savings when I used modular. Architects and engineers, 47%, and then the trades, 46%. And you can see the breakdown there. 
Um, and again, I'll tell you a little bit more about that report uh, after these next few slides. This one is probably one that everybody's seen. I think everyone in the industry uses this particular graphic or a version thereof, and it's the time savings. And, and that is really the biggest advantage of modular construction is the uh, impact on the schedule. Um, and there's a good reason for that. With modular construction, you're able to uh, simultaneously work on the building in an offsite factory while you're doing your site work and your foundations. Top row, site built construction is very linear, sequential. First you do this and then you do that. You can't start building the first floor until the foundation's ready. With modular construction, we can take that uh, construction component and, and slide it up underneath the concurrently with uh, the site uh, development. So that time savings we're finding is on average about 30%. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, work and had a lot of conversations with the uh, hospitality industry, uh, Marriott in, in particular. Um, they tell us on, uh, I think they've done perhaps 20 modular hotels uh, to date. And they said on the low end, they, uh, they cut a couple of months off of their schedule. And on the high end, they cut eight months off of a 22-month uh, project, I believe it was. So it's uh, it's significant um, that time savings, if you're an owner or a developer, franchisee, a retail establishment, the sooner you get open, the sooner you're generating revenue on that, on that property. So that's huge. Um, so rather than highlighting the cost savings, um, we prefer to highlight the time savings, which has a pretty big impact on the return on investment. Uh, the next few slides, we don't, I don't think as an industry, we do a good enough job um, promoting these advantages. Uh, this, this chart highlights the positive impact of modular construction on reducing construction waste. And anyone that's been in the construction industry knows that's a huge problem that we don't talk enough about. Um, there's so much waste on a typical construction project and if you've ever been to a site, a job site, you'll see dumpster after dumpster full of pieces of drywall and two before and scraps that just get hauled off to the landfill. Uh, with modular construction, a lot of that activity, again, is occurring in a controlled factory. Uh, better ability to recycle materials, better ability to purchase in bulk and use leftover materials for the next project, if, if you will, uh, rather than throwing away a you know, one-foot piece of two before, you can use it. Uh, but this chart shows the impact of um, waste reduction. And if you add up the very high, high, and medium, you know, you're looking at 90, uh, what is that, 92%? Um, 92, 90, no, I'm sorry, I can't do my math. 86%, I'm sorry. Low, medium, high, or very high reduction on waste. Not sure, 5%. But apparently just not tracking it. Um, but low, you know, 8% some sites, 94% of everyone says they reduced waste. Um, you get down here to the very high and high, that's a pretty significant number. You're looking at, you know, 45% of everyone that uses modular says it's a very high impact on waste reduction. Um, and again, that's just less construction and material going to the landfill. Um, and then this one probably talked about a little bit more with COVID uh, this year than in years past, uh, but, but I'm glad we're talking about um, worker safety. What is the modular impact on overall safety? And this one had 203 uh, respondents answer it. And you can see the chart there for yourself. Very high, 23%, uh, uh, high, 33%, medium, 26%. I mean, this goes to the heart of the matter. This is a safer working environment than traditional job sites. Um, and, and, you know, 203 contractors, owners, developers, architects, uh, this is their personal experience with it. Um, we've, you know, been in touch with our members on what they're doing with COVID in particular. Uh, and this is all prior to COVID, this, this data. Uh, but with COVID, it's, it's probably even a bigger impact because we're able in the factories to social distance and workstations, uh, the proper PPE uh, in, in the factories. You can test temperatures as they, they're coming to one job site every day rather than different sites throughout the year. So 
that overall impact on safety, uh, that's, a, that's a big one that you're going to hear us talk more about in the future. And there is uh, there's so much more in that, uh, that report. Um, that's available at no cost. You can go to our website and download that. Um, if you go to modular.org and click on the resources tab, you'll get a little drop down menu there and it'll say research results. This report's on there and there's several others. So I would encourage you to go there and check that, um, check that resource out. It's got two sections. They have the first part of that uh, report is prefabrication, which is wall panels and other forms of offsite. And then the second half of that is strictly volumetric modular. So good stuff in that report. We are very uh, pleased and proud to work with Dodge on that. Um, that. That is a great report. I'm glad that you brought that up because I get quite, you know asked questions all the time from traditional builders, especially in the commercial arena and you know since this past COVID I mean haven't you guys seen an increase of just calls and people really considering moving over to this form have you seen an increase um, we were before COVID um, okay. we were seeing it the, the two or three years prior to it and, and I'll tell you what I think the biggest driver was is uh, is the labor shortage labor availability um, coupled with owners and developers uh, perhaps putting more pressure on uh, GCs to finish projects faster. Um, you get this perfect storm of you add COVID in there with the labor shortage. Our infrastructure needs, at least in the U.S., are off the charts. Our housing needs, our uh, school facilities, uh, you know, we have massive infrastructure needs and a labor shortage. Uh, so it's got a lot of uh, contractors in particular um, trying to figure out how they're going to build projects in the future. And we've had uh, major GCs, um, maybe not shift all the way over to modular, but look into modular, starting modular division, um, and, and you know, certainly pursue, try to move as much of the projects offsite as they can. So that's, that's been a big trend with COVID. You know, it's, it's just been so messy this year. Our guys have been very busy. Um, and again, I think it's a controlled environment that they work in. Um, the bottleneck for us seems to be uh, the code officials and the approval process. And a lot of those code officials are working from home now. and That kind of slows up projects uh, from time to time. Um, material availability and being able to get material, that's a problem across the board, not just modular. Uh, so those are some things that are temporarily slowing some things down, but that lack of labor um, is going to be a big driver. Um, and that is not going to change for the next five years. Um, you know, we've looked at the data and in, in about five years from now, we're going to have a million less skilled laborers in the U.S. than we do now. And it's tight now. Um, and I don't know in your world, but I don't know a lot of young people that are going into the trades right now to fill those vacancies that are going to be created by um, all the folks retiring. So I think it's going to be a huge problem. That, um, you know, I'm curious with you being, with you saying that, Tom, are you seeing that um, a lot of the factories that are, I mean, there just seems to be factories coming um, about like left and right in my world, especially in the Denver, Colorado market, it seems to be a hot market. I'm just wondering, like in our state, we actually have a group that actually created um, the Colorado Building Academy. And so they're trying to teach more trades in that um, scenario. Are you finding anything on your end, you know, being close to the factories and, and working in commercial that they're starting to create more programs for factory workers? Yeah, you know, the, that, good, good point. We, um, a couple of years ago, started working with the University of Florida, um, and they have a network of community colleges. They created a manufactured construction training program. And they teach it in the uh, community colleges in, in Florida, and it's a curriculum that basically, um, you know, teaches kids how to read blueprints and safety and the basics, but it talks about working in a factory. So that's the kind of first formal uh, training program that I'm aware of that really specifically said, we're gonna teach you how to be a, a modular factory worker. Wow, um, that's exciting. It's good to yeah, hear. Yeah, it is, and I, I hope it uh, gets replicated all across the country. And we have a lot of manufacturers individually that will work with their local community colleges or trade schools and uh, you know, do programs uh, like that. Um, but 
you know, nationwide, uh, there's, I haven't seen a movement like that, but I think we're going to uh, just out of necessity more than anything else. Very cool, so, thank you. Yeah, so that report's available, it's uh, free. You can download it on our website. Um, there's a bunch of other resources on there too. Um, we recently um, finished a project with Fannie Mae. Um, you know, what we found when we step back, every aspect of construction, everything, uh, from financing to uh, procurement to um, everything, um, how you build it, the building codes, everything was written for a site-built world. So we're having to go in and um, create resources and tools for lenders. How do I lend money on a modular project when it's a little different than a site-built project? You need more money up front, but then the schedule's shorter, so, you know, it's different than what they're used to. So we worked with Fannie Mae on, on just that. Here's a lender's guideline for multifamily modular uh, projects. And this was done under the umbrella of the um, Offsite Construction Council through the National Institute of Building Sciences. So um, that came to that table. We worked on it. MBI put a lot of hours into that one to, to get it off the ground. That's available now. And Fannie Mae sent that to their entire lending network. So we're hoping that lenders across the country at least have a better understanding of, of modular construction and how to finance these projects. Um, you see the Dodge report there. That bottom report is our industry uh, analysis, our industry and the report. And each year I will survey all of our manufacturers um, and ask them things like, how many square feet did you produce? What markets did you produce for? What was your revenue? And we put all that information together and I'm gonna hit a few slides here in a little bit. In our industry and the report, it is extremely difficult to get information from companies in this industry. But we've been doing it for a long time and, and we're to the point now where our members trust that we're gonna put it in a good report. We're not gonna share their individual information, but we're gonna aggregate it and, and put it back to the industry to say, here's the industry average. Average manufacturer does this. Um, so it's kind of a benchmarking tool for our industry as well. And what we found is many companies will reference this, publicly traded companies will reference this in their SEC filings, um, and many companies uh, provide it to their lenders for financing. So it's a good industry uh, information. And on these next few slides, I'm gonna hit a few highlights in it. I'll say this, if you're a member, this report is free. If you're not, you can buy it uh, on our website. So there's my little commercial for the day. Um, but here's part of the uh, industry information we found. Um, the key markets that our members are building for um, in North America, this is US and Canada. We've got about 60 members in Canada right now, so it's a stronghold for us. Um, education um, and office, business, administrative space are the two big markets still. They have been really, since I've been the director here, it's, those are kind of the core markets for, for our industry. Um, but these next few markets, multifamily in particular, uh, saw the biggest growth in 2019. So it's currently 7% of, of, of what the factories manufacture each year, but it doubled in size year over year. So it's the fastest growing market. Hotel hospitality, 5%. Both of those were virtually zero uh, five years ago. Maybe multifamily was a blip. There was no, very few hotels. So now that's 12% of the industry uh, production between multifamily and, and hotels. Um, healthcare was about 5%, and this is year in 2019 data. My guess is that number is gonna go up when we do the 2020 numbers um, due to how many people were constructing facilities for, for COVID. Um, and we can touch on that. So I think healthcare and multifamily are gonna be our big growth markets going forward. Institutional and assembly, that's things like uh, prisons, police stations, fire departments. Uh, we, seems like we do a few of those each year. And then retail, I'm always surprised by how low that number is, um, given that it seems like quick serve restaurants would be a slam dunk for modular construction. Uh, if you go to a McDonald's or a Taco Bell or a Wendy's or whatever, you want it to look the same no matter where you are, so why not have one factory just make all of these for all the franchisees or 
you know, two or three factories doing it. But still only 1%, again, that quicker construction schedule, you can sell those lattes or those cheeseburgers a whole lot faster and pay for your building. So still holding out some hope that the retail market's gonna, once it kind of rebounds, that uh, there'll be more modular facilities out there. So those are kind of, that's a snapshot of, of what the industry builds. Um, let me back up one here real quick. Our report, what, what we're finding, uh, so this is the, the North American market. We've got about 25 members now in Europe, so we created a European council, uh, and we're able to get uh, case studies and projects from that group of, of members and uh, do a little analysis for, uh, for our European members. So we're trying to build this report out each year. Uh, we've got members in South America, we're doing the same thing, case studies, what's your market look like down there? So trying to make this truly an international report. It is still heavily North American, but there are sections in there for um, Europe and South America in particular. We good? Yes, for sure. All right. So this could be boring. Uh, but this is what we're spending a lot of time on lately. And I'm not going to spend a great deal talking about this, but just hit some highlights. Um, about five, I want to say five years ago, uh, our board hired uh, Professor Ryan Smith and Ivan Rupnik to do industry research for us. We wanted to know why other countries seem to be adopting modular construction at a higher rate than we are here in North America. Um, you know, Japan, Europe, China, Australia, everyone seemed to be kind of getting on board with modular. And, you know, we're kind of hovering around that three, four percent mark. We wanted to know why. So those guys went all over the world and they studied modular and um, found out, you know, what the adoption rate, Sweden's something ridiculous, like 75 percent, um, and brought that back to us. And, and what we found, uh, there was a lot of different variables. Some of it was culture, some of it was materials, some of it was a large number of manufacturers in a very small geography, like England, like Japan. And you know, here in the US, we have a small number of factories spread out all over the country. So there's no real concentration of a lot of manufacturers in too many areas. One of the things that came out of that research was there needs to be more industry standards. Um, you know, it's, it's a different process depending on what state you're in. There's different approval standards. There's just, you know, just does a 12 foot by 60 foot box, is it really 12 by 60 or what is it actually? So there was a dire need to develop some industry standards. Um, you know, if we're gonna move from construction to offsite construction to more of a manufacturing process, we've gotta have some consistency and some standards in place. So we've kind of went all in on that one and we're currently working on five different industry standards. Um, Two of them are with the International Code Council. Um, I'm the vice chair of these, these uh, uh, working groups. Um, we're developing uh, two standards called ANSI 1200 and 1205. Those are out for public review right now, I believe, on uh, ICC's website. And you can probably just go there and search these terms and find it. Uh, but these standards are going to be, one will be a standard approval process. You know, how do these things get approved? How do modular buildings get inspected at the factory? Is it done by third parties? What's the criteria for a third party? What goes in the quality control manual? What goes on the data uh, plate? You know, what, what goes on the insignia? All of that, we're gonna create an industry approval process. And what we hope to do with that is, um, you know, there's 35 states now that have a program, there's 15 that do not. We want to target those 15 states and say, here's a standard program right off the shelf. It's an ANSI standard. You can adopt this and you've got a modular program ready to go. And then go to those other states that are perhaps um, outliers from what the standard will be to try to get them moving more towards this, this one standard. So if we can get as many states as possible on a standard consistent approval process, that's gonna be a big difference for the uh, manufacturers that build in four, five, six, seven states. Now they know it's all the same. Here's my one quality control manual. Here's how everything gets approved and that'll really expedite uh, everything we think. So that's the ICC standards. 
FGI, Facility Guideline Institute, they came to us and wanted to develop a rapidly deployable modular medical unit, a standard for that. And if you don't know FGI, these are the guys that basically write the standards for the healthcare structures in the country. And um, after COVID, what we saw was just a little bit of chaos and madness. Everyone needed space, but there were no standards. People were buying and selling, you know, might have been a mobile classroom, but they just needed somewhere like a triage type uh, facility. And then that kind of morphed into the Corps of Engineers saying, let's just turn convention centers into uh, triage hospitals. So it got really messy there on the front end. But what that led to is there really should be a standard way uh, to build a, a modular medical facility that meets the FGI guidelines. Um, so again, we talked about healthcare being a pretty small percentage of what we do. If we can come up with them, we will, we're almost done with it. This uh, FGI guideline, then everyone will say, hey, that's the standard. We know we're gonna need a hundred of those units. Who can, we, who can we call to build those? And it's gonna be the same standard across the country. So again, thinking ahead, we, we think that's gonna help our industry and, and really help prevent what happened uh, at the beginning of, of this crisis. Uh, a couple more. Uh, again, I mentioned we've got a lot of members up in Canada. Um, we're working with the Canada Standards Agency on a uh, standard for high-rise modular buildings. And what we're doing there is they've got a standard for approval process of a modular unit in the factory. But once it leaves the factory, there's really no standards. Um, so we want this standard to address, you know, what are the transportation? What are the um, mate lines and the, and the module to module hookups? What should that look like? Things like that. Uh, so that's going to be included in the CSA standard. Um, and then this last one, the UL2600, that is a standard, that's final, and that is for the relocatable buildings in Canada. So there's a certain way to build them. Um, some of the provinces have referenced this. We're trying to get this in the national building codes in Canada, so it'll be universal across the board. Relocatable buildings in Canada use UL2600. So that if anyone's ever worked on a standard, they know the ICC ANSI standard, it's about a two year process. And we're doing two of them at once, plus these other three standards. So our plate's pretty full on, on trying to develop um, all these uh, industry standards. We're doing okay, Audrey, any questions yet or? No, I think it's great. And I think it's super awesome that you guys are trying to create these industry um, standards because really that's the biggest goal, right? Is to make it more standardized so that we can get more people involved in using this and especially factories and manufacturers. I think that's such a great solution. So I applaud you for putting those pieces together. I think that's a huge movement in the right direction. Yeah, and, and we wrestled with it for a while. You hear standards and people think um, standard design. And, and they, they, they get concerned that you're going to limit our creativity and everything's going to look alike and now they're going to look like boxes. And really what we're talking about is the core, you know, that interior module. Uh, there absolutely should be a standard hotel room module so that Marriott and Hilton and whoever can say, you know, I need a standard guest room and, and at least is a wood frame or steel. Here's the dimensions, A, B, and C, instead of just right. everything being a variable. Right, and I'm sure like they could pick their selections and their design and their exterior finish and they could still have an architect, right? We're just exactly. simplifying some of the pieces that go into it. Yeah, they want to brand it to look like their hotel, um, but there's no reason why the structural you know, modules can't be standardized. Same thing with hospital rooms. Hospital construction costs are outrageous. Um, you know, if we could standardize you know, steel frame, FGI uh, approved standard, hospital rooms. Um, I think that would move us pretty far along in terms of bringing the cost down ultimately. And again, not having such a shortage of healthcare facilities when the next crisis hits, because there will be a next one. If we ever get out of this one, there'll be a next one. Why do you think there's so many people in Canada? Or why do you have such a, a big increase in Canada um, that's building and building partners there? Why is that segment so big? Well, we, you know, there's, it's very similar to the U.S. We've got, uh, most of the members are U.S., about 300 of them, uh, but about 60 are from Canada. 
Um, and, and what we found is, you know, there, at one point there were some regional um, trade associations up there, but there was nothing across the country to kind of bring everyone together and say, for all of Canada, here's this. For all of the U.S., really, so we're, we're kind of that broad umbrella, really, for all of the world. Uh, but we've got our U.S. members, our Canadian members. Um, I, I think that's part of it. The other part is, you know, we've done the legwork there. We've been there. We do multiple events in Canada. We meet with these folks. We tour factories up there. We've built trust with a lot of the uh, companies in Canada and U.S. I think that's probably the biggest uh, benefit we've got going for us is uh, we've developed relationships with a lot of these companies. So they trust us. We trust them. If, if we say, you know, here's what we need, they generally will step up and help us out. Um, but that yeah, didn't come overnight. Seeing, um, yeah, one of the seeing, things were, I'm okay. sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, we're seeing more of them trying to get into the Colorado market. Um, I have a lot of connections and, and, and this is a targeted market for them. Why do you think that is? Um, well, I'm guessing you have housing needs there in Colorado <laughs> and you have labor shortages. That would be one. <laughs> housing needs, high housing needs, low labor availability, or the cost of labor is just not practical to, to you know, build affordable housing. Those are the two big drivers, high, high housing needs and low labor availability kind of conflict and make people say, there's got to be a different way to build this. What if we streamline some of this? What if we automate it or push some of this into a factory setting? And that's where people are heading. Um, and I, again, I'm totally biased, but every industry does this. Every industry has already done this. And construction is now saying, yeah, we can do that too. We build airplanes this way. We build cruise ships this way. We can build hotels and, and apartments this way. And we have, and, and I think that'll grow. But it's usually high housing needs and a low labor availability, or when you can find it, the, the cost is too high for, for the labor. Uh, those are the two biggies. Thank you. And speaking of Colorado, wow, great segue, Audrey. So <laughs> we've done these offsite construction expos. MBI is the host sponsor of these. They're the primary sponsor. Um, of course, before this year, they were in-person events. Uh, we've done 11, 11 of them in person over the last five years, built these relationships up. These are intended for end users, owners, architects, engineers, uh, to come to these and say, okay, I understand the advantages of modular. I get this time savings. How? How do I implement modular into my next project? Give me the details. And that's what these are intended to do. Uh, the speakers for the Denver event, which is next week, by the way, um, we've got an architect, we've got an engineer, and we've got several um, manufacturers doing case studies, a lot of them on multifamily housing. This is the project. This is what we did. This is what we ran into. These are the advantages. Architects saying, here's how you design for a modular project. Engineers, same thing. So this is kind of our crash course uh, on modular and offsite construction. These events we've broadened to include panelized, uh, all forms of offsite, uh, precast construction in some cases, uh, bathroom pods, uh, modified shipping containers. This is kind of your all in uh, for anything offsite construction. Obviously, this year we had to switch into uh, digital, digital events, but we're going to make these as much like that in person event as we can. So this event next week in Denver, we'll have six speakers. We're gonna break it up over two days. Um, I don't know about you, but I've tried sitting through six and eight hour Zoom meetings and they're just, they're painful. So we're gonna break it up over two days. Uh, three speakers one day, three the next. But we've got, right now we've got 18 digital exhibitors for this Denver event. Um, and you'll be able to go to their booth, click on it. There'll be a couple videos there of them talking about what they do but you'll be able to live chat with the exhibitors during the show hours. We've set up some uh, technology there so that you can talk to the exhibitors in their booth. Um, so we've tried to make it just like being in person with this advantage. You don't have to fly to Denver. You don't have to stay in a hotel. It's much more cost effective this way. So offsiteconstructionexpo.com. Uh, that one's next week. You can sign up for it. 
But then we've got one coming up in Toronto. I mentioned we do a lot of work there with our uh, Canadian friends. Um, and then we do, we're do we doing one in D.C. on November 18th and 19th. And that one we're really hoping to hit uh, a lot of federal level policymakers. I talk about housing, I talk about disaster relief. Those are ideal markets for modular construction and uh, gets a little frustrating when policymakers um, in our country seem to put barriers in our way for greater adoption. And we see other countries where policymakers uh, remove barriers and almost encourage modular construction as a way to be more efficient. Uh, that was one of the big differences is governments overseas, uh, they don't necessarily promote it, but they write rules and incentives that encourage it. And here, we always seem to get roadblocks put in front of us, uh, more paperwork, more fees, more inspections, when they should be doing the opposite and saying, look, this is, a, this is more of a manufacturing process. We need to streamline this. This needs to happen much, much more in the U.S. So these are the three events coming up. Um, Email us if you, know, if you think you want to go to one, you're not sure what it's about, we can give you the scoop on that. Um, here's my little contact information. Tom at modular.org is the easiest way to get me. I've always got this with me, so um, I'm checking it all the time. Um, so you can track me down that way. I'm going to stop my slides here, uh, Audrey. Come back here. Awesome. Um, I was at your event last year, the Denver event, and I yes. have to say it was amazing. Um, I met some amazing people, um, different industry leaders, and I thought your speakers did a great job at not only informing, but actually having practical discussions of their projects. So I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to be great. Of course, I would love to be in person as well, but we've got to do what, what we have to at this point. So I'm glad that you guys didn't cancel and you're still continuing it. Yeah, the Denver event last year, I think that was our best one we've ever done. It was just a good turnout. Uh, the speakers were willing to share, even where they had problems on the project, which, you know, you don't often hear that, but it's, yeah, those but it are was the best great. practices you want to hear. It's like, boy, if I did that again, I would do X, Y, and Z this time. Absolutely. Uh, but what really makes them great is when we do these uh, region specific, we can get all the manufacturers from that area to exhibit. So if you're looking like, well, who are the manufacturers in my area? They're right here around the room. Same thing for these digital events. Um, you know, the, the manufacturers that serve that area are going to be the exhibitors. So. Yeah, that was really great. So I, Tim or Evan, or there's another person on the line, do any of you have any questions for Tom? I mean, this is kind of like ideal for you to, to ask because we never really get to see him because he's always working so hard uh, with the industry. But I, any questions for him? Thank you, uh, I'm registered for the events. I, I'm looking forward to to uh, attending. Um, I think just um, we've spoken and presented at a lot of modular events, uh, sharing our Japanese history. So if you ever need speakers, but um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how the chat goes with the vendors. And yeah, thanks for all the work you're doing for sure. We are too. Uh, Internet. Interesting, you, you mentioned the Japanese manufacturers. Uh, we don't have any of them in our membership, but I was uh, e exchanging some emails this week with a gentleman who works with them at Seiki Su uh, in particular. Um, so we're, we're trying to build that relationship. Amazing what the Japanese manufacturers are doing in terms of automation and, and technology. It shouldn't be a surprise, but um, you know, they're doing exactly what we want uh, our industry to do. Learn from other industries. Learn from your auto industry how to build homes. Uh, implement lean manufacturing techniques. Um, you know, make it more of a manufacturing industry. Right now, it is off-site construction. You know, there's some assembly line. There's some uh, robotics. There's some automation. Some companies are much higher on the scale than others. Uh, but there's a lot of off-site construction happening in the factory as well here. So yeah, good to hear, Tim. Yeah, I think that the key there is, oh, sorry, Evan, I saw you. I'll, I'll just really quick, um, mod, most of the, over half of the modular in Japan is done. And I'd say this too about Sweden and Finland, Norway, is done by the developer. So the developer 
is the modular builder, is the handles the assembly, has all the equipment, has the warehouses, uh, builds, rents them out or sells, sells the home at the end, handles all the warranty, handles the property management. It's a real end to end. Yeah. Um, and that I think is what created the level of ubiquity. We just need more people to be like that here because otherwise the modular manufacturer ends up being the, the middle person. We're all trying to dis, you know, it's, we're trying to disintermediate. Um, that's part of what modular offsite brings to the table is that sort of factory mindset. But in an effort to disintermediate, a lot of times what we've created is another layer. Yeah. So. Good point. We're, um, yeah, it's still somewhat fragmented here. There's a lot of players on the project. Where it gets exciting and a little helpful is when you have a large developer like a Marriott or a Hilton or someone like that that says, look, we want to develop a, a prototype or a standard and we want to do 500 of these and they can kind of drive the standardization down versus i'm working with one franchisee this year and a different one next year they've got their architect and they've got theirs and that's where the inefficiencies creep in but uh yeah another good point tim i think evan's ready he was he was jumping in there yeah well see if my audio is working. I, when I switch from Teams meetings to Zoom meetings, I can never remember which headset I'm using. <laughs> um, so, you know, first and foremost, thanks so much for speaking to the group. Um, I think, you know, looking at those standards is going to be something that I have to follow up with a lot because, you know, I'm in the legal department of a big architecture firm and I'm trying to kind of move us in a modular direction. But the thing that I keep hearing is, well, if we make a mistake, then it's going to get replicated 500 times over. And how do we know how that plays across this state, this state, and this state? And so, yeah, those standards would be a godsend, I think, and, okay. and would really help us understand it. So, Well, one of the, I think one of the biggest benefits that we offer, and then again, I'm selling you my commercial here, um, we work with all those state agencies we know who those contacts are. We know what the rules are. We, we get that call a lot. We had a company from Australia that said, we want to enter the U.S. market and we want to sell in all 50 states. What do we do? And I laughed at them like, stop. You know, you're not going to get approved in all 50 states. Um, start somewhere. California. Okay, let's tell you about California. You mean it's different in other states? Yes, it's different. There's a different agency. It has a different name. There's different rules. Yes. Um, we keep track of all that. We've got a government affairs director. That's all he does is work with these state agencies and, and federal contacts. We've literally, people will say, I'm having trouble with a local code official. He won't approve our plans. We'll call him and we'll say, look, you've got a statewide program. It's been approved by the state of Virginia. You have to take it. You know, that's not your responsibility. So it, it takes the company out of the conversation with the code official, which is we all know you may win that, <laughs> but then you're going to lose. Uh, and it puts the association kind of saying, hey, we're, we've been hearing there's been some issues with approvals in, in your county or your state. Can we talk about it? And it just makes it a little less confrontational. It takes the bullseye off your back. So mm -hmm. those are the resources we can provide. You know, it's hard when you put on a web, here's the member benefits and you could sell X, Y, and Z. And you could say a lot of our members take advantage of that. And frankly, a lot of them don't take advantage enough of, can you help me move this project forward? And we say, well, what's going on? Code official or so-and-so or third party, whatever. And more often than not, it's happened to someone else or we've heard about it before or another state does it differently and we can bring that to the table. Uh, we can help you. Okay. How active are you in uh, California? I, I'm splitting my time between an LA office and a Sacramento office, so I sort of see the, the fighting capitals. We just had a call last week with John Westfall and the team at HCD that oversees our industry. Great call. We're talking about, um, probably shouldn't say this, we're talking about hiring a lobbyist in California to introduce legislation to make the modular program better. It's one of the best programs in the country. Um, and I think California gets a knock a lot of the times for the regulation. It's one of the better modular programs in the country. And we, we want to make it even better because 
the housing needs are off the charts. I mean, it's probably half the country's housing needs are in California. Uh, so we want a great modular program there that other states can replicate. So we're very active in California. Okay, very cool. Very nice. That's great to hear because I know that um, Urban Air has been expanding in that area. And I know that just manufactured and modular, you know, just having some kind of conversation and changing it is super helpful. We had a conversation in Seattle trying to get some regulations changed there too. So I guess we're all working together to make things happen, which is nice. Yeah, it's, I, I don't know how people build buildings sometimes. It's like, oh my gosh, this is a yeah. nightmare of paperwork you have to go through to right. build something. Well, thank you so much, Tom. I mean, it has been such a pleasure. I'm so happy that you were on today and just to give us that overview. And it's great to see the optimism and, and the things that are happening in the industry and how we're all changing and growing. It, it makes me really happy because I only started this three years ago. And what I have seen in three years, I can't imagine what you've seen in you know your tenure there. It's got to be just madness. <laughs> well, it, it is. Yeah, this is year 16 for me as the director of MBI been running the residential group for uh, eight years. Um, it has changed so much, but what keeps me going and keeps me driving is it's just getting started, really. I mean, we're 4%, 5% of the market. I want to be here when it's 25% of the market. And, you know, there's, you know, there's another 100 manufacturers across the country and creating jobs. And, you know, that's the exciting part to me is this thing is still on the front end. Uh, there's a lot of growth yet to happen. I would encourage every architect, owner, GC to get on board with it because that labor shortage is going to hit hard in the next five years. And the companies that are on board are going to be that much further along than the companies that are trying to learn it five years from now. I'm glad that you made that point because I happen to agree with you. I figured you would. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. I always love talking about the industry. Yeah. Uh, Modular.org. There's a ton of resources there, a lot of free resources. Uh, but if you want to get in a little deeper, Evan, if you need some help, like, hey, we're, we're, we're thinking about jumping in, help us out. We'd be glad to do that too. Okay, great. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. It makes me very, very happy to, to hear that and, and, to, and to get, you know, to be in that space. Um, just really quickly, you just wanted to thank our partners, um, Art of Construction, Urban Air, Mountain View Window and Door, Modular Sure Site, and 303 Development. Um, here is my contact. If anybody has any questions or need more resources or information, um, please reach out because I'm always looking to help as well. I think that's key to our industry and making things grow. And in the meantime, um, I can't thank, it's always, it's always a pleasure um, having these conversations and, and making things happen. And, and so I'm, I'm certainly happy about making that happen. So until our next show, which will be on um, September 29th, I wish you guys all a great rest of your week. I hope you enjoyed your Labor Day weekend and uh, we'll look forward to having the conversation. All right. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Guys. Bye. Bye-bye.